I took the liberty uh, to actually take uh, two topics that probably have been discussed uh, the most, or at least they're the most hyped uh, in 2019, and, and merge them together, and bring them together. That's artificial intelligence and social determinants of health. Um, it feels like um, you can't read anything or you can't turn the corner where these topics, or at least one of them, is not uh, present. And uh, for any uh, for-profit company or startup, uh, whether they're doing it or not, or whether they're uh, deeply involved in it, if they, if they put one of these two words in, uh, in their description, the, the valuation seems to go up by at least 20%. So anyway, my goal for this morning is uh, because uh, I want to make this, uh, this real for all of you because um, I do strongly believe that uh, each one, and particularly when you bring them together, uh, they will play a key role uh, in how we deliver uh, care for patients uh, moving forward. We've had the opportunity to um, uh, test a, a number of different things, bring those uh, concepts together. So, so today I want to share some of those with you. I want to share with you where um, uh, we see, where I see the, the, the industry evolving, what's required to put in place to actually make these things uh, uh, real, and uh, again, share some of those experiences that we've had uh, so far. So, so let's, get, uh, let's get started. Um, um, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the key uh, uh, elements that I want to walk us through the agenda today uh, is to talk a little bit about the innovations driving uh, healthcare digital innovation uh, across uh, the, the, the community. And also then uh, to be able to, uh, uh, to, to share with you uh, some very specific uh, uh, case studies. I think uh, nothing like making it uh, real and sharing some of the learnings, some of the um, uh, elements that uh, we've uh, learned throughout uh, the years. But uh, one of the things that I want to acknowledge at first before we dive into some of these topics, and actually I'm going to start with a, with a quick uh, case study, a quick story, is that when we think about healthcare innovation um, and the, the rate of change, uh, that has accelerated significantly over the last few years. And if you just simply plot these two concepts of rate of change versus time and look at technology innovation, um, what we tend to see that several years ago, uh, this inflection happens where the technology innovation has uh, significantly uh, outpaced and continues to outpace our human capacity to actually leverage that technology. Um, so we have more technology, we have more data, we have more information that actually we uh, can leverage and, and use. And part of our challenge is how do we actually uh, catch up? How do we actually use technology to our advantage to bring this information that we have together to more holistically understand individuals and then tailor those interventions based on those specific needs? The first sort of uh, uh, story that I want to share with you uh, sort of points uh, to me to part of the problem. So meet Karen. Karen is a 44-year-old mother of two, um, happily married, works in healthcare IT. Um, used to be a softball player, but uh, uh, as uh, um, she had children, so children were growing up, she's become a bit more, uh, uh, more sedentary, probably doesn't exercise as much as she'd like. And um, during her annual checkup, uh, her physicians, a physician uh, uh, told her that she uh, has high cholesterol and that's something that uh, she should start to, to address. So um, uh, he recommended to put on Prevacol, um, a uh, cholesterol-lowering uh, drug, uh, pretty mild, uh, has uh, fewer side effects on, uh, and it's easy on the kidney and the liver. Great, Karen's doing well. Things are going well, but fast forward six months from now, and Karen's husband is traveling more. Um, Karen's 14-year-old da daughter, well, it's been 14, uh, so she's dealing with uh, uh, some of that uh, drama for any of you that uh, have children or have had children that age, you, you know what I'm talking about. And Karen's company was recently acquired. She has a new boss. Uh, she has a lot of pressure uh, at work. Needless to say that, that Karen is anxious, um, she has a hard time sleeping, she's becoming depressed. So she sees the primary care physician, uh, explains uh, how things are going, and he recommends that, uh, why not, uh, uh, let's, let's put you on Paxil. A night depressant, um, uh, again, uh, uh, something that's uh, relatively mild, FDA approved, wildly prescribed, um, uh, all good, Karen starts taking Paxil. Fast forward six more months, Karen comes back for her annual checkup, uh, her physician runs the usual tests, and comes back and says, Karen, um, unfortunately, your blood glucose level over the last year 
has increased by about 19 milligrams per deciliter, about 20%, and now we're in that uh, early diabetic stage, so we need to start to figure out how do we address this. Uh, obviously, uh, shocking news to care and life-changing uh, um, uh, diagnosis, uh, and they're starting to really plan for what to do. Well, at the same time that Karen was going through, uh, through her journey, uh, Dr. Allman, uh, a researcher at Stanford University, started doing some, some data on um, uh, drugs that are widely prescribed and started to try to, to really understand certain uh, uh, patterns. And two of the, the drugs that, uh, that he studied were Pravacol and Paxil, uh, drugs that at any point in time, we typically have about 13 to 15 million people taking those drugs. So what he noticed is that about a million of those people were taking these drugs simultaneously. And when that happened, um, what he typically saw was a 20% increase in blood glucose level. So roughly about 90 milligrams per deciliters for the non-diabetic patients, up to 50 milligrams per, de uh, milligrams per deciliter for diabetic patients. So this is also not a trivial problem because any um, uh, adult over the age of 55 takes three to five different medications each week. And it's impossible to even take the drugs that the FDA approved, considered to be safe, to fully uh, expect a, a, a clinician, a physician, to be able to understand and be able to tease out those potential interactions. So to me, it points out to this vast problems that we have as technology, as treatments continue to evolve, uh, our capacity to really understand those from a healthcare perspective becomes increasingly challenging, in some cases limiting. So how do we solve for that? Well, the, if that's not enough, we also need to recognize and we operate under, uh, under this principle that health actually doesn't begin in our acute care facilities and our um, uh, healthcare environment, it actually begins where we spend our time, it begins where we live, where we learn, where we uh, play, where we pray. So that is also influenced not only by our healthcare journey, but also by our life, in being influenced by the environment that we spend our time in. So when you start to not only take the complexity of the healthcare data that we're managing every day, and add, for example, life data, so when we think about just uh, some, some really interesting study out of uh, IBM, looking at the amount of data that we personally generate each day, when you think about that we send about 2.9 million emails every second, that we upload 20 hours of videos on YouTube every minute, or I'm not gonna go through all of these, but even if you think about that we order close to 73 items um, on Amazon every second, um, we personally are all generating a vast amount of well-considered life data that gives us insight into preferences, needs, uh, et cetera. So add this to the uh, increasing data in healthcare. And then also, when you start to also start to understand the data about the environments we all spend our time, Things that are related to those social economic, social determinants of health, data about access to transportation, data about access to healthy food, data about the challenges that exist in each of those environments. We're starting to really become, hopefully not overwhelmed, but look at this as a tremendous opportunity. How can we leverage this information in the way that can not only inform clinical decision making, but also tailors the interventions that we do specific to those, uh, uh, to those individuals? All of this is not possible without really advancing as our capabilities to manage these different data sets because they do come in all forms. They do come in all kinds of uh, modalities, different refresh uh, rates, and apply advanced analytics to be able to bring it together and make some sense of it and present it in a way that's useful. So to me, a, a great way to think about this is sort of not only where we are, but where we're going, but how we actually leverage advanced analytics is a framework uh, of the driverless car that actually Eric Topol uh, uh, su suggested uh, uh, a year or so ago. That I think it's a it's a great way to uh, to create this uh, this analogy. If you think from a from a, a driverless car analogy, um, where we've historically been and where we still are is sort of the day zero one, where the we're complete control, or every now and then uh, when we cruise on the highway, we put on cruise control and take off. 
feet off. But we think that with the driverless car, we could be involving with hands off, uh, eventually uh, becoming more automated, uh, eyes off. We're going to get to minds off and become truly a passenger, but at least from a uh, driverless car analogy, that's where we're progressing. If you apply that to healthcare, truly we've not even barely gotten two feet off. That's where we are today. What we're talking about over the next uh, three, five years is start to incrementally increase what we can um, start to get more partially automated, potentially in some areas more highly automated, particularly in the areas where we have uh, back office uh, uh, elements, supply chain is a great area where this uh, can be applied. But increasingly, we're starting to be able to leverage technology similar to what the way we're thinking about applying into uh, uh, autonomous car uh, to be able to augment how we make clinical decision making. We're not going to replace the physicians. We're not going to replace the clinicians. But can we use this technology to be able to leverage the vast amount of data that we increasingly are generating to be able to enhance those clinical decision making processes? So that's what we're trying to solve. That's where I see AI, machine learning, this, this concept of cognitive computing starting to really have a meaningful role into how do we understand patients how do we understand their family? How do we understand their situation? And then start to really tailor the ter the, those therapies uh, based on their uh, capacity to not only engage, but uh, in a lot of cases to self-care. So not only that this is not complex enough, but we talk about AI or prescriptive analytics, uh, it also, and they require a whole ecosystem around them for them to be effective. Um, if you think about it, just uh, the more blocking and tackling, we'll talk about some of this through some examples. They require different platforms to be able to manage the, the, the data, to be able to manage it in a very different way. We require different ways to actually immerse ourselves in the data, to visualize that information, in addition of how do we understand it, how we communicate it, how we make that transparent and not keep it as a, as a black box. So all of those type of things become very critical in order to be able to uh, bring this information to be able to leverage those concepts of AI or machine learning in a way that's actually useful. So that's the, those are the things that I believe are fundamental. I believe it gives us hope, and I believe it has played a critical role at least in our journey uh, to date. So with, with that background, let's actually spend some time talking about some specific case studies. I broke this section up into two different parts. One is let's talk about how do we use social determinants of health, how do we use AI, and how do we bring that information together to manage and recertify patients as they come through our acute care facilities. I think there's a tremendous role to be able to intervene upstream uh, in those type of situations. And then the second part, I'll talk about what's required, not only from a technology perspective, but also from a process perspective of uh, creating this concept of connected communities where we can digitally connect providers with the rest of the community, including community-based organizations, to be able to holistically address the needs of uh, individuals that, uh, that we serve. So that's how we're going to spend the rest of our time. Let's uh, start with these uh, uh, first uh, case studies and uh, want to highlight some uh, very specific examples. Um, the, other, the other thing that hopefully you'll take away is that these things don't happen overnight. The, the, the arc of innovation is relatively long only because it requires not only bringing these uh, data sets together, that most of them require to be at the individual level that involve all the regulatory uh, elements that are associated with the personal health information, but also requires that technology to be able to manage it, uh, apply it, et cetera. So in this, I'm gonna talk about two different concepts. I'm gonna talk about first the application as it relates to a, a trauma mortality application. And then I'm gonna talk about briefly about what the technology infrastructure is that, that bring to the right uh, of the screen uh, to be able to enable that because that's gonna be foundational for the other uh, case examples that I'm gonna share with you as well. And I promise I'm not gonna to get uh, uh, too geeky on you uh, th this morning uh, or this afternoon um, and uh, keep it more towards the, the application. So let's talk about this um, uh, trauma model first. Um, this went live. It's a model that we've actually worked on uh, for two years. It went live in August, August uh, 5th. And it was trying to solve Parkland, uh, where we deployed this, is a trauma one, uh, trauma one level uh, center 
uh, one of the busiest and one of the largest uh, emergency departments uh, in, the, in the country. One of the complexities that the trauma surgeons are dealing with are the influx of patients coming in. Um, those that are responsive or non-responsive, uh, but equally uh, being able to, to manage the ongoing information that comes in on these patients to make these critical decisions about where do they need to uh, allocate resources, what do they need to focus on, are those individuals stable to be able to be taken to surgery, and those type of complex decisions. They are very dynamic in nature. And today, the, today, the only scores that have been available to assess the complexity of patients coming in are static at the front end, and it was based on uh, limited uh, factors and, and somewhat uh, manual in nature. So we took on uh, ourselves to actually build a trauma predictive score uh, to use the, 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 the clinical information on the, uh, in the history of the patient coming in when it was available, but then be able to integrate uh, as, as uh, new diagnosis, new labs, new information is coming in real time into this predictive score. And predict the risk of mortality over the next 48 hours. We focused on um, uh, patients over the age of, uh, of 18 with trauma activations levels of one or two. So um, the goal was to not only be able to build a model that's uh, uh, real time, uh, that actually evolves as the new information is being generated of that individual and becomes something that the surgeons and the clinical teams in the emergency department can use real time for this critical decision making not meant to be used uh, in isolation, it's meant to be used as an additional point of view as they uh, uh, synthesize through all the information that they have at their disposal. One of the other key components to make this real, and you see this, uh, uh, this theme play out throughout my presentation, is that it doesn't matter how accurate uh, or how powerful the predictive models are or the analytics, unless they are being leveraged and displayed within the workflows where the clinicians and physicians do their work, they are marginally, if not, uh, no useful at all. So in this case, one of the key requirements was to be able to actually display the score within the, uh, in this case, the uh, Epic hyperspace, to be able to display it exactly where the physicians, where the, the trauma surgeons were logging in uh, to do their work. You kind of uh, see it where the, the little arrow points, uh, it's called the, the P star score. Dr. Star is the, uh, the lead uh, orthopedic trauma surgeon at Parkland. We collaborated extensively to do this. So, uh, uh, for uh, no other reasons, uh, we made it that uh, it's for now. Um, so, fast forward a couple of weeks. So, this is now, uh, it's a Sunday morning with six weeks into the Go Live trauma model. Um, and on Sunday morning, our team actually gets a text from Dr. Starr. Uh, Dr. Starr is the gentleman uh, to, to the left. The uh, uh, gentleman is one of uh, the other trauma surgeons, one of his colleagues. And if you know Dr. Starr, the, 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 the um, uh, uh, humor in this doesn't uh, actually uh, surprise you, but uh, his text uh, uh, says, uh, trauma patients came in yesterday, still no score. Does the algorithm take the, takes the weekend off? Uh, well, part of this, th this was um, uh, something that obviously <laughs> we take very seriously uh, because uh, this is critical to uh, uh, patient care. Uh, so obviously we jumped on this right away. Uh, we diagnosed the, the, the problem. Uh, it was actually an error in the, in the checking logic for missing actually respiratory data that was not showing up um, uh, appropriately or the, the right frequency within uh, uh, electronic medical record, uh, et cetera. Uh, but we diagnosed it, we, we fixed it, we, we, we came back together to, uh, to make sure that how do we elevate this uh, when that happens. But the moral of the story here is that um, for the lead trauma surgeon at a trauma one level center, to take the time on a Sunday morning to actually text that, hey, I'm not seeing this score. What that told us right away is that the adoption for this was rather rapid. Six weeks in, this is something that the trauma surgeons are checking in on every patient and they're leveraging as a critical point in the, that uh, clinical decision making. So if uh, moral of the story to me here is that if done appropriately with the right level of engagement, with the right transparency, display within the workflow, these type of models take are being adopted and take on at a much rapid pace than we historically uh, have thought. So they need to be useful, they need to be additive. Again, they need to be displayed within the workflows where actually individuals do their work. You can't expect folks to uh, start clicking through uh, 
uh, three different screens to be able to go to look for one additional uh, point of information. The other um, uh, component is that this would not have been possible without a completely different uh, technology ecosystem. So uh, uh, wind the clock back about 18 months, uh, this takes us back about February 20, uh, 2018, where we really started to, to, to look at what's required to be able to make these type of models uh, be effective, not only from a development and testing perspective, but also from being able to apply them in that real time, apply them within uh, that uh, uh, workflow. And uh, as we've gone through this journey, we discovered there are several things that are really important. I want to share those, uh, those with you. One, data ingestion is a critical component and the flexibility of that is, is uh, so important because it's not just bringing in uh, and being able to analyze and look at clinical data, but all the other information that's critically important around it, whether it's social determinants of health, whether it's uh, uh, remote monitoring devices, et cetera, becomes critical to be able to holistically integrate it into these, uh, these models. Obviously the middle where the sort of uh, the, the fun happens where developing those models uh, with the supervised and supervised met methods, et cetera, uh, that's where uh, the, the fun happens. Although the majority of time is actually spent at these two different ends of the, of the spectrum. But then equally is not only how you evaluate the models, how you actually deploy them to be able to create and reinforce the learning cycle and make that available. One of the other key components is how do you drive this, uh, this real-time integration? How do you use API or the fire technology that's been emerging to be able to integrate within the workflow uh, tools? So one of the, the, the key things is um, we build this technology called Ismus. Uh, for us, it was really important because we are at, uh, set up as a nonprofit. We're set up as uh, uh, somebody who wants to, uh, to collaborate, uh, sharing the knowledge that we generate. We actually build this with as many open source uh, uh, modalities as possible because we want it to be replicable. We want it to be able to be used in these demonstration projects that we're involved in, whether it's uh, NIH grants, uh, NQIC, uh, Accountable Health Community. Uh, and leverage the best that's out there. So this is built on top of Microsoft uh, Azure Cloud Platform to leverage all those capabilities and the data security that's associated with it, but then really leverage as many open source modalities uh, and incorporate those in a way that makes this uh, very shareable across organizations, across uh, institutions. We believe that uh, uh, sharing others and collaborating and being able to actually learn from others is the way we need to do things to really advance uh, and accelerate the pace of change uh, in healthcare. But anyway, the, the, the point around all of this is that um, in, in order to, re to make these uh, models useful, that concept that it requires a completely different ecosystem that is able to really create this loop between pulling the data uh, real time being able to then analyze it, store it, uh, combine it with other information, and then generate the algorithm that can be equally pushed back into workflows. This is a very critical component in order to be able to, to make all this, uh, all this work. Um, the, the last example that I wanna share with you before we get into uh, connected community uh, component uh, is another sort of what I think is a, is a, a rather uh, complicated and large problem, and that is addressing uh, individuals that are at risk for adverse drug events. Um, I had the opportunity to, uh, uh, to do uh, uh, a lot of this work with our teams uh, before I joined PCCI when I was uh, an executive at Vizient, who part of uh, the, uh, the HEM collaboratives. As you th uh, think about those, those top 10 uh, conditions, uh, consistently what we saw is uh, the ability of organizations to address adverse drug events um, was uh, uh, was uh, difficult. Uh, and because it's mere complexity, some of the things that we have already talked about, uh, this vast amount of information and data and the challenge of really knowing ahead of time, knowing proactively who is at risk. So um, the, the, uh, uh, what I also wanna highlight here is, particularly since these are new concepts, um, the, the application of artificial intelligence to social determinants of health of these uh, large uh, clinical data sets, uh, also requires a, a, a very prescriptive uh, innovation uh, uh, element to it. And I want a part of this uh, also uh, share with you the innovation process that I believe uh, is required to really be able to manage some of these things. So if we apply this to uh, adverse drug events, and the name for, for this uh, is uh, uh, RAID, the scope of the problem was that uh, at Parkland, 
Uh, we uh, have about 275,000 ED visits, uh, about uh, 75,000 uh, uh, discharges. So a, a large number of uh, individuals coming through the facility, uh, all trying to be uh, managed, identify for adverse drug events and other uh, pharmacy related conditions by three FTs. Um, so um, the, the fit, first problem is, well, who, do we, who should we focus on first? Who, who is at risk? Uh, the, the team uh, being super innovative uh, developed uh, initially some, some algorithms, just uh, uh, manual process for risk stratification to be able to, uh, uh, to at least uh, start to focus on individuals. But what they found was they were spending more time uh, trying to find who's at risk than actually having the enough time to actually intervene. So as we look at this, it's like, well, this is a perfect uh, uh, data problem. This is a perfect ad problem because we're talking about uh, large sets of data, uh, large sets of historical data. Uh, what we've learned also the social determinants of health play a pretty significant uh, role into the risk profile uh, of individuals uh, for this as well. Uh, but also be able to, to understand the interaction of the information, uh, comorbidities, uh, the medication that individuals are uh, on, and be able to risk stratify those that every single individual that comes to the organization in a way that then the pharmacy team know who's at the highest risk and they can spend their time intervening with those. Just like with the trauma example, uh, how you deliver this information became really important. Uh, just a quick uh, uh, schematic to the to the right of this uh, under the the, the two uh, uh, ladies uh, that uh, clinicians um, not meant for you to read, but uh, the uh, the point of there is uh, again same concept that this uh, is actually displayed real time within the electronic medical record. So the other key component is not only highlighting the score um, and the risk level and uh, really using colors to, to highlight that. What you see that box to the right is really giving insights what's contributing to that score. So going beyond just saying, hey, this is somebody that's at risk, uh, displaying the information of why. And the reason that's important is it provides the clinician information about where do should they, should they go next. So I think mean, that's a critical element uh, that was uh, important, not only as we looked at this, uh, this problem, uh, but uh, um, something that I think globally is an important element is uh, how you make this, uh, this type of information. Uh, two years uh, into, this, uh, uh, into this program, um, it was uh, presented at it was presented uh, at American Essential Hospital, national meetings, et cetera, received uh, uh, quite a bit uh, of attention because it works. Um, and um, some of the couple uh, key things, uh, we started at the upper right, uh, fully EPIC integrated, uh, again, scanning through uh, 85, 87 uh, uh, patients uh, on an uh, annual basis. Um, what we look at, uh, uh, risk stratified dose, about 10%. Um, and you know, th this is not forced, it's just how, how the model plays out. Uh, are that high risk? Uh, and then being able to start to intervene on those high risk uh, uh, patients. Uh, what I think is really interesting is to if bounce a little bit to the upper uh, upper uh, left was that the team completely changed how they're doing their work. So instead of uh, spending the time finding the patients who are at risk, we're spending 100% of the time consulting on the high risk you know, individuals. Um, this two year results was also done with one fewer uh, FTE that uh, occurred through a departure and then the time required to actually replace. But uh, they were five times um, higher uh, likelihood that they were actually consulting on those, uh, on those patients. A significant amount of hours they were saved by the uh, pharma, pharma tech teams. Uh, over 2,000 uh, ADEs prevented, uh, a large number of those being minor, but not an insignificant amount, 164 uh, major ADEs. 23% uh, reduction in readmissions, and we quantified that using uh, uh, HRQ uh, guidelines, et cetera, uh, you get to about quickly to about a uh, close to $3 million cost saving potential for this as it expands to up to a $17 million savings. So, you know, taking aside obviously the, the, the human impact that this has on patients, uh, preventing that, uh, but also a fairly significant uh, ROI component. So I think the sort of the applications for how we bring together um, these advanced methodologies to vast amounts of data uh, is not only there today, 
but I believe will expand significantly over the next 12, 24, 36 months as case studies like this become much more prevalent and much more real. What I get really excited about, not that this is not uh, meaningful enough, is when we start to really look at how do we actually start to connect with the broader community to be able to meet the needs of the individual beyond just their health um, so what I want to share with you during our remaining time is uh, a concept, an approach, some results and case studies on how do we actually meaningfully connect clinicians with community-based organizations to address the social determinants of health outside of our healthcare environment. So let's get jump into this a little bit. So what is sort of that uh, uh, social determinants of health model? that I believe is required and our experience tells us that it's important to have. And we have done this work across Dallas and, and a couple other communities over the last six years. We kind of have the, the, the scars and bruises, so to speak, by uh, uh, really trying different models. And when we took a step back and looked at everything that needed to come in place to really be, build something that not only works but sustainable, we triangulated towards six different areas that are critically important to be able to actually make this work. Kind of let me walk you through this uh, because I think it's a little bit uh, complex. First and foremost, what you see in the middle in red is that governance structure. Uh, because the, to address this, it requires a variety of leaders across the community, not only the uh, uh, the uh, healthcare leaders, oftentimes health plans. Uh, community leaders, the local municipality, et cetera, that governance structure is really important to really define what need, this needs to look like uh, and how it's going to evolve across that community. Each community is different, uh, but uh, the structure on this is critically important. Part of the role of that governance group, you see it in that uh, blue circle uh, uh, right outside of it, is to develop a legal and policy, not only for how the data is going to be shared, how individuals are going to imagine how consent is going to be created, who and how that information is going to flow between all these different uh, organizations, and how is the privacy and the security of that information and data is going to be uh, addressed and managed. So that legal and policy component becomes one of the first things that that uh, uh, community, that entity uh, needs to define. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the technology. Certainly the technology piece plays a critically important part. Well, um, we've built one of the, the first technologies in this space called Pieces Iris. Um, we're actually fortunate enough to uh, receive uh, uh, approval for the patent for that in the last couple of months. But, but certainly that's not the only technology out there. This uh, space has proliferated with new uh, options uh, over the last uh, uh, year or so. Uh, the electronic medical record uh, companies are also integrating some of this uh, information within their systems, etc. The only way to say, uh, I believe the technology needs to play a critical role, if not the only component. I'll share with you what I believe are some of those key elements that are required. But equally important uh, around that are the other sort of uh, column tracks. One is the clinical workflows. So uh, based on how this information is not only being collected, but how those individuals are being managed, referred, followed up. There needs to be defined on where and how this needs to be integrated within the existing clinical workflow, whether it's in the clinics, whether it's in the emergency department, on the inpatient side, et cetera. Each one has its own uh, complexities. But one of the things that we need you know, to pay even more attention to is how these uh, new information concepts, technologies need to be incorporated into the community workflows because there are different levels of complexities, there are different levels of capabilities and skill that exist there, and those need to be adequately involved and incorporated in order for them to be useful. And finally, the, the green is um, critically important to both define upfront, but then measure and track over time, is how do we measure success? Um, how are we going to measure the impact of this work how do we measure the ROI or SROI, that social ROI that this generate, in order to be able to, to track and demonstrate progress and also start to build towards those sustainability models? Because oftentimes uh, in a lot of communities, uh, there's an initial investor, initial uh, uh, organization that's sponsoring this, whether it's a grant, whether it's a philanthropic organization, it's like a United Way, or whether it's a healthcare provider that uh, uh, get this off the ground, but that measurement 
that evaluation becomes an ongoing critical component that needs to be defined up front in order for it to then expand and build the appropriate sustainability. I'm going to go through the outer circles in each of these colors. They tend to represent maturity models as this evolves, but uh, that's probably uh, too much for today. We can get into those uh, type of things uh, 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 later if, uh, if desired. We talk about technology, I think there are a couple uh, critically important parts to realize. When we talk about technology to enable these types of models, the, the social determinants of health analytics, um, there's a maturity curve that uh, um, this sort of uh, uh, explains. One is the left-hand side is only using uh, uh, clinical and claims data. Basically, not really doing anything with social determinants of health. And to, uh, to be honest with you, uh, as I travel across the country and do this, uh, this work, uh, I would say more than 80% of the organization are still in that. So way of saying is that things that we're talking about today, while well, there's a lot of uh, excitement and a lot of movement is still somewhat early in this whole, uh, this whole evolution process. Where you do start to see immediate uh, work because the complexity is not as high is that level one, where organizations have started to actually create proxies for social determinants of health from clinical claims data they already have with, at their fingertips in their acute care facilities. A great example of that uh, that we've leveraged really early on was to actually look at the number of changes of addresses uh, on a patient's record over the last 12 or 24 months, which would indicate housing instability. So you start to create proxies based on the data as that uh, involves certainly applying natural language processing to that uh, data information to be able to scan through uh, physician notes, uh, nursing notes, uh, case manager notes, et cetera, to be able to tease that out uh, uh, become something, a different way to leverage that data, but that also requires more sophisticated uh, ecosystems and uh, technology. So a lot of ways to be able to leverage existing data. Level two, and I'll give you a, a, a specific example on this, is start to leverage the vast amount of local or national data that's available, bring that together to organize in a way that gives you information about the neighborhoods, the blocks, uh, those individuals leave, live in your community and what are the complexities associated with those environments because those can become barriers to not only access but oftentimes barriers to health or uh, compliance with the uh, prescribed uh, treatment protocols. So I'll give you an example of that because that's sort of the next evolution in this, uh, in this model. And, and finally, um, what we're trying to get to and this space will continue to evolve. It's actually have technology that truly digitally integrates and creates this information transfer between clinical practices, between clinical sites and community-based organizations to be able to use it as a case management system uh, that shares in that information about, uh, about the individuals. And there's several uh, examples of that. I'll give you one. So let's uh, maybe uh, look at uh, an example on that category two. Um, and this doesn't need to be overly complex and complicated. Uh, one of the things that we took on um, in across uh, uh, DFW area and across Dallas County was to look at the existing available data sets, uh, both locally and nationally, and create a set, in this case, we focused on about 60 indicators uh, that are indicative of some of these social economic challenges that uh, play out across the community and understand how those play out at the block level. The reason I'm mentioning block level is that that's a very important distinction to make this actionable. You tend to see um, this information uh, oftentimes uh, at the county level or if you're lucky at the zip code level. And what I would argue with you is that while that's certainly useful for certain applications, try to use this to really understand at the individual level as proxies for those complexities. There's way too much variation, particularly within urban environments at the zip code level for it to be new. I'll give you an example of how we directly saw this in the data in a second. But being able to quantify this information at the block level starts to be really powerful. So be able to look across parameters and metrics concurrently becomes something that's really important because oftentimes a lot of correlation between these. So whether it's you know school-aged children with SNAP, whether it's measures of resiliency, uh, we incorporated uh, the error deprivation index. It's, it's uh, an algorithm developed at the University of Wisconsin. Increasingly, CMS and governments using uh, 
this uh, uh, this data uh, to be able to um, really understand the complexities associated with these different environments, uh, as well as we ingested and started to use uh, 911 and 311 data and apply natural language processing to the free text information to be able to quantify some of those local uh, characteristics that are self-reported by individuals that live in those communities. So a couple of key important things. One is to be able to visualize this across the community and be able to zoom in at the block level becomes really important. Be able to look at the individual metrics that are important relative to whether it's transportation, housing, uh, access to daycare, uh, et cetera, or certain demographics. Be able to look at these over time and be able to look at this concurrently to be able to look at the correlation intersection on this. And do it in a way that you don't require an advanced mathematics or you know uh, degree or uh, coding expertise to do it. Do all the back uh, and uh, work at the end. Integrate these multiple data sets, present in a way that can uh, somebody can integrate uh, Really, really quickly. You'll be amazed how quickly this starts to make an impact and a difference, not only on the clinical side as you incorporate these into your algorithms, but how community-based organizations start to use this to really make the case for the resources that they need to program to grant uh, uh, etc. This is uh, currently being displayed and being leveraged in a number of different uh, uh, sites across uh, the DFW area. Uh, one of them, if you'd like to go to after this webinar, is Health in North Texas. It's hosted by the DFW Healthcare Foundation. Um, uh, it's powering uh, the analytics behind this data community data collection. So uh, go ahead and play with it if you like. Uh, I think that one of the other things that we'll focus on is how do you make this replicable uh, the pretty easily in other communities? And that's something that uh, I think it's exciting uh, to uh, share the, the, the later time. One of, the, one of the things we're incorporated in this was we're looking at and working with the local Medicaid plan um, on how do we actually reduce the rates of preterm birth? Uh, a, a huge problem in most communities, particularly communities uh, that have a large population of uh, individuals with social economic challenges and also high populations of uh, African American Hispanic women because it tends to be more prevalent uh, in those populations. So part of this was let's take this information that now we have about the community, uh, be able to geomap to individuals to understand the complexities take the history of healthcare and create a machine learning based restratification model so we know who's at highest risk, um, not just because they had a, a, a previous early delivery, but even for new moms, uh, and then tailor intervention specifically to those individuals. With the goal is that if we can actually increase prenatal uh, care attendance visits, uh, we can uh, let clinicians actually increase the timely evidence-based interventions for those individuals. Uh, we can engage individuals more. So we use the texting uh, approach and methodology to do that. Then we can actually uh, reduce uh, uh, and move uh, that uh, gestation cycle to reduce preterm birth. Uh, this program is uh, a year into its maturity. We have a year of data. And uh, what you can see that the results are actually really encouraging, uh, where by being able to risk stratify individuals, focus those uh, 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 communication by enrolling these individuals into uh, text uh, communication, um, tailor the communication based on the risk level, both the frequency and the type of messaging. We're able to, to increase prenatal visit attempts by 24%. Um, and then ultimately, preterm uh, birth rates decreased by 27%. Uh, the uh, post-delivery baby cost per, month, per member per month decreased by 54%. And in this cohort that was uh, um, intervened on uh, 600 patients, 23,000 uh, risk stratified by 600 they intervened on, uh, about a million dollars, uh, very conservative estimate in sort of that, uh, that uh, savings. So uh, the other key lesson here is that when we actually use the model um, at the block level, the predictive power uh, was for the social determinants of health elements were outside of the top 10. When we actually modeled that to the block level, that was in the top three or four of that uh, uh, predictive. Uh, so again, further evidence that for these to be meaningful, they need to be brought down to uh, the, uh, the block level at least, or if not to the individual. So uh, the last example let me share with you briefly is how do you do this at the individual level? Because ultimately that's, that's a bit of the holy grail uh, so share with you a bit of the, the, the process that's required, the technology, and how do you actually make this, uh, this work. 
Um, we've done this again uh, in Dallas for about six years uh, that started the work over the last two and a half years. We also apply this and it's the core uh, approach uh, to the Accountable Health Community Grant, which we're privileged to uh, have the opportunity to lead and work with uh, a number of uh, uh, healthcare providers and systems uh, uh, here locally, as well as a number of uh, uh, plus community-based organizations. So, um, how do you, what's required to create sort of this comprehensive connected uh, community? I would say one is required to really understand uh, your market readiness. So to sort of understand the unique area of needs, the readiness of the community resources, how consolidated uh, uh, or dispersed those are, what are the gaps in services, what those gaps are on, and what's the willingness of individuals to be able to, to work together? Because then you start to be able to get to the concentric circle that we talked about and be able to then start to work towards those, uh, th those implementation plans. One of the other key thing is to really recognize all the different touch points that need to occur if you're going to start to not only understand the needs of individuals via uh, typically a survey, uh, the number of different surveys that have emerged. Uh, CMS uh, has put one out that's being used for the accountable uh, care communities, some the electronic medical record uh, uh, organizations uh, have uh, their own surveys, but they all sort of get to this uh, core needs assessment on housing, utilities, food, transportation, safety, uh, et cetera. So we need to be able to meet people when they, uh, uh, where they are, whether they're in the community or, uh, or whether they're at the acute care facility, uh, understand who's, a, who's a, a risk and then be able to survey them to understand specifically from them what their needs are. Uh, you need to be able to enter that information and collect it uh, into an electronic system. Um, you need the system to actually create a resource summary so you can understand not only what the needs are, but where it's most relevant to for those needs to be addressed. Uh, you refer that individual uh, and then you assign a case manager because just referring that individual once, you need to be able to have the technology, the capability to track whether the individual showed up, what type of service you received, and then for the case manager to prioritize who do they need to reach out month after month to make sure that those needs were resolved. So um, just identifying a need, maybe making a referral, uh, I would argue that's not enough we really comprehensively want to, uh, to, to address the, the needs. Very quickly, I mean, this is complex on its own, but the technology itself needs to have, I think, a lot of different characteristics to be useful because it needs to work both on the clinical side and the community side needs to be, uh, I strongly believe it needs to be cloud-based because it needs to be easily deployed across communities, uh, even with organizations that have very limited um, uh, computer uh, capabilities and whether that's, uh, uh, you know, as long as they have internet access with the lesser version of Chrome, to be able to do that. The updated GeoMap referral directory is critical. Worst thing you wanna do is send a patient somewhere only for that place to be closed or for them to not be eligible to receive those services. Uh, so those configurable intake forms to also understand eligibility becomes really important. Obviously, security, both on the back end, how the data has been managed with the front end, uh, how do you generate consent, multiple levels of consent uh, is, uh, is preferred, and then to be able to uh, generate uh, quick reports on the back end is something that I think is really important. So we want to put this information back in the hands uh, of those that interact with uh, individuals. Once you start doing that, the, the, the insights that you can start to generate both across a community locally exponentially become more powerful. I'm not gonna go into details here, but you can start to really understand at the individual level where those needs are, the complexity of those needs, or those you know, uh, stack bar charts, where the clinical sites are uh, from an access perspective, where the community uh, services are uh, to meet those needs and start to really be able to understand the gaps that exist uh, to be able to meet those. It starts to be able to engage the community, those across the whole ecosystem in very different discussions that all align around the, the, the specific needs of individuals and communities uh, of individuals uh, across that, uh, that, that geography. It also becomes really powerful because by being individual, you can start to really generate personas with common needs that start to really be able to give you insights into how do you approach the community, not only by providing services, but how do they receive information? How do they make decisions about their, their, their healthcare or their, uh, the, the other needs? And this becomes something that's much more tailored based on groups of individuals that have uh, common, uh, common needs and common characteristics. Um, 
This was applied um, for a Robert Wood Johnson grant that looked at individuals with hypertension uh, and had food, uh, diabetes and food insecurities. And what we learned is when we're able to send this information and coordinate across the sites, you tend to start to have some pretty meaningful impact uh, relative to the support for those individuals. So that's something that um, um, I can be happy to provide more results on. A lot of lessons learned here, both what worked and what did not work, uh, but uh, uh, it, it's something that uh, it might be worth uh, a discussion for later for those that are interested. One exciting thing for us is I mentioned that we kind of summarized all this uh, information uh, uh, over the last six years that we've had. Um, uh, we, our goal was to be able to share the knowledge that we generated for those that are embarking on this journey to so to make this information available. We did not want to approach it from a consultative perspective or uh, uh, any other ways. So we're fortunate enough for uh, HIMSS Publishing to actually pick up uh, our knowledge that uh, we wrote and uh, uh, we organized it into a book, into a playbook of Building Connected Communities of Care that's going to be uh, officially launched on March 9th at the Orlando HIMSS meeting. Um, you see a link below if uh, you want to take a, a, a peek at it. Uh, it's, it's out there for pre-release, but uh, it's something that we're very excited about because it's the first of its kind that gets into those very deep levels of uh, uh, how to do these things and what we learn. It's a practical guide. It's not meant to be for bedside uh, uh, reading, but uh, hopefully something that can help other communities uh, advance what we've been able to do uh, tell us. So I probably like I wrap it up with what what are we, where are we going next? Uh, and what I think as we look in the next five years is that uh, we're going to move from this concept of social determinants of health to the concept of personal determinants of health. Not that looking across a community is not important, but really personalizing the information. What that means to me is that we'll be able to make progress of how do we integrate this information? Call it a cognitive health record, or call it a holistic view of that individual by using more of this advanced AI-based methodology and risk predictive models to personalize and present this consistently in a way that's useful for clinicians, for others they interact with, individuals in the community. I believe we'll be able to, to leverage and negate uh, other data sets, whether it's pharmacogenetic, genetic data sets, um, uh, integrate measures of self-care capacity to be able to understand that and expand our knowledge about uh, each individual. Um, and then uh, I believe that uh, we'll be able to uh, uh, expand access via uh, digital uh, connections with our mobile devices, with this telehealth, et cetera, that's gonna play a very critical role also in non-traditional sites. Um, and the other, the, the, the final thing I think we're gonna start to see so much more activity on is this whole addressing this concept of how to bridge isolation and that's both mental and physical uh, will be a, a, a subset of this, but an increasingly huge uh, so relative to our journey, um, we've uh, been focusing on sort of care optimization. Um, we've evolved to really test and uh, play around and prove, demonstrate the use of digital ecosystems. Uh, stuff that I share with you today. But what we're really interested as we look ourselves to the next five years is how do we focus on this concept of person in power health? Um, how do we actually leverage emerging tools and technology to better understand and support individuals as a whole uh, person in a very meaningful way? So um, uh, selfishly, if, if you heard something that uh, resonated, uh, uh, if it's something that you want to discuss further, if it's something that you want to collaborate on, um, uh, would uh, certainly welcome that, uh, sharing the knowledge that we generated or explore some of these uh, fun and new concepts uh, together. Um, I'll wrap up by, with, with this slide, it's just a reminder um, uh, from, uh, uh, the organizers about the Florida best practices for psychotherapy medication guidelines for adults. And this is available to, uh, to, to you, and uh, this is a nice reminder. And I'll pause here for any, uh, uh, any questions uh, as we're approaching the top of the hour. So uh, thank you very much. I hope that you found this uh, not only interesting, but useful uh, as you think about the, your, your journey. We do have a question here. Uh, it reads, Dr. Myth, where, if anywhere, do environmental factors fall in your, um, I guess this is Department of Health, SDOH yeah. levels, or I don't, I'm not sure what that stands for. Yeah, um, th that falls under the, the, the area of the, uh, the, the community, the environment, that the component okay. that understanding the characteristics of um, those elements of where people live, work, play. 
Um, that's actually interesting that you ask. It's one of the one of the areas that uh, we tracked, incorporated, we uh, in the using and developed a pediatric asthma model. So you can imagine some of those uh, uh, specific environmental factors relative to air quality become really important. Um, a bit of a similar story we learned there is that uh, we ingested and played around with uh, EPA uh, sensor data across the community. But what we quickly learned is because of uh, those being dispersed too broadly across the community, the specificity of that information is not uh, not enough. So one of the things that uh, that we started to, to to really look at and play with is uh, much more specific uh, deployment of IoT-based air quality devices uh, where that's needed. Because similar to some of the other concepts where zip code is not specific enough, you need to get to the block level. Same applies for air quality. Uh, as a as a uh, specific uh, element, as uh, having to think about some of those those factors, but uh, to be false falls under that um, neighborhood uh, information characteristics. Okay, thank you, and thank you, Maurice. Uh, uh, wrote in that it stands for social determinants of health. So thank you for clarifying that for me. Um, and then we have another question: Have you already started a dialogue with free clinics to include them? Yeah, no, I, I, clinics are a critical part of this, and actually, uh, most uh, a lot of the a lot of the program uh, programs that we do uh, involve uh, involve uh, involve them. Um, I think uh, uh, just as we think about how do we make this scalable, some of the the uh, workflow challenges we need to adapt and understand, and it's not a one size fits all because it depends on the population that the clinic serves. It depends on the uh, the workflow that needs to be adopted about uh, particularly when uh, there's a desire to collect this information individually uh, from patients uh, needs to really fit well within either the registration or the, the, the discharge process it needs to be thoughtful about where do you do some of these conversations because uh, they're personal they're not conducive to be done uh, within an open space uh, but then also be thoughtful that it, it takes time um, and you need to to uh, weave that in within the whole workflow uh, that's associated with. Uh, okay, we have another question. What additional measures do you foresee included in personal determinants of health? Oh boy, that's uh, that's a fantastic question. And I think as we've uh, we started to do quite a bit of a sort of called evaluation uh, work, but uh, a couple of things that, uh, that that come to mind right away is one is the capacity for self care. Um, I think that's something that we've not necessarily focused on. I don't think we, uh, we fully understand yet, uh, but that's something that's also, uh, I believe uh, it's quantifiable uh, and be able to, uh, to, to really understand that. Uh, the, the other um, uh, component is, and I don't necessarily like this term, but um, I don't have a better one, is that idea of um, learned helplessness. One of the other things is that uh, when we engage individuals, uh, sometimes it's not that they don't know that a service exists. Uh, they have used the service as not being convenient or friendly, and they don't use it anymore, or they don't believe that can be useful to them. So I think as we look and, and how do we uh, actually not only be able to help individuals better manage their health by reducing ED business, reducing utilization, uh, being able to provide them with the adequate food, how do they become more um, resilient themselves? And I think part of their resiliency is really understanding and addressing this, uh, these two newer, uh, newer concepts uh, around the uh, uh, capacity for self-care and that, uh, that uh, learn helplessness. Because um, without them, um, it's going to be uh, it's going to be easily. Okay. Many NPO, including free clinics, will be key in gathering in the gathering of the data. How do you anticipate working with them? Yeah, and, and I'm not sure if I have a full uh, uh, full uh, answer to that. Uh, and I'll be honest, I have to uh, think through it. Uh, I think to me, um, what's going to be really important is we need to recognize for everybody that's sort of part of the ecosystem um, what their incentives are and how you actually help them meet those requirements or those incentives. And the other part is the, uh, the data collection, because if that information uh, is not uh, being able to be brought back in, um, then it's hard to be able to, uh, to, to replicate and, uh, and push it back out. Um, so I think 
one of the other things that we're thinking a lot about, whether it's information about social determinants of health technology systems or, inform or information systems uh, at a variety of different uh, clinics, um, is you can expect, you're going to have a fragmented market for that front end technology. So what I think is required is to have a back end data layer that is, is capable of bringing information from regardless what front end system organization use to be able to merge it, to be able to uh, uh, merge it with this other information and then push that back in a way that's useful. So um, I need to think about it a little bit more uh, uh, to fully answer it, but I think this, this additional layer of uh, backend information that is not dependent on the front end utilization will need to come in place because uh, we're already seeing a, a lot of diversity in the type of systems, electronic systems uh, for patient management that uh, 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 and clinic use, we're seeing it uh, evolve on the community side. And without that, we're just going to end up with a huge fragmented market where one of the systems uh, talk to each other, and then it's really difficult to bring them together. Okay. Are the state health departments part of the conversions, um, sorry, conversations and resource anticipation? Yeah, no. I mean, locally here, uh, I think it's, it's critical. Um, we, uh, um, collaborate extensively uh, with the county health department, um, particularly one of the things that, that they found extremely useful, and it's, you know, this is evolving as well, is that the community data, uh, the block level that I showed you, uh, that's something that uh, they're finding extremely useful as they're looking holistically at the population, obviously enhancing the, the, that data uh, specific to initiatives, whether it's immunization, so you really understand that, whether the specific programs uh, around the HIV, that's one big initiative uh, here locally. So uh, I think they're in each market, they're, they're, they're critical. Um, I would not look at those departments at uh, uh, significant funding sources, but a critical partner in this journey. And thank you for an excellent presentation. Did you state that there was a meeting on this topic in Orlando coming up? I'm uh, not sure if I misunderstood. Um, sorry, so um, th there is certainly the, the, the meeting that uh, the uh, uh, South Florida uh, uh, group is organizing um, in, uh, in February. The meeting that I was alluding to is the HIPS uh, annual national meeting in Orlando. Um, I mentioned that in reference to the launch of that Connected Community uh, Playbook. Uh, that, that's a meeting that uh, um, has 60,000 individuals attend, usually only two places that can accommodate is Las Vegas and Orlando. It's in Orlando this year. So I was referring to, to, to that meeting. Well, wonderful. From that, from, from, from my perspective, uh, uh, very appreciative of the invitation to share uh, uh, this with you.